Um, now tonight's CBD meeting is on physical termite barriers. Um, Matthew Lawther uh, has run a number of courses of which I've attended some, uh, enjoyed them very much. Uh, this particular um, seminar is one that uh, Matthew ran uh, a few months ago for the Institute of Building Consultants. Uh, it was very good, very interesting. Uh, I thought it would be of good value because at the end of the day as builders we're responsible for all components of the structure including the correct installation of termite barriers. So let's learn as much as we can about them. Uh, if, if there's problems, termite infestations or damage, as you know the consumer will come after us. So we need to arm ourselves as best we can. Now, um, Ma Matthew is Lawther is from the M MPL Training Centre. Uh, Matthew worked for TAFE for a number of years. Uh, he's been doing training. He was with uh, Rapid Insurance for some period of time in the insurance side and the training side. Um, so could I please ask you to welcome Matthew. Thanks, Alan. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all here. It's uh, another one of those topics uh, that, that covers all those things about building inspections uh, which may not be apparent to us uh, on our everyday work. So today's talk, as you know, it's on, it's on um, physical termite barriers, but I will cover some of those other barriers too that you may encounter while you're also doing inspections, just so we don't leave any of those out too. Uh, Alan was mentioning a, um, a seminar that I ran for the, uh, for the conference, and it was a little bit longer, and I was able to go into a bit more depth on some of these barriers, but today what I'll do, I'll, I'll run through uh, some of the slabs that we deal with in everyday terms and we'll look at how those slabs are protected by the various barriers and what evidence you'll see on site so that you can recognise those barriers and, and, and check if they're, if they're doing their job basically. So uh, yeah. So at the end of this session You'll be able to identify the different slab types and the correct treatment required. Be able to state how to protect service penetrations with the various systems. Be able to state how to install the barriers in a retaining wall system. State how to protect internal footings and thickened beams. Be able to identify the barrier components. And be able to identify all of the Australian standard paperwork, um, which we now know is being called up in the building code. So, Basically, what I want to do is start off with what's out there. Like we, we know there's several and certain barriers out there. Let's look at what barriers are out there, how they're meant to be working in buildings, and what evidence uh, you'll have to know that those barriers are there on site. Firstly, we've got stainless steel mesh. Mostly that is just termi mesh. Termi mesh is a stainless steel mesh that's, that is mainly used, uh, say for instance, in a, in a brick veneer home. It's a perimeter uh, barrier that goes around the perimeter and it also, um, they've got collars as well that go around the service penetrations. It's just simply there designed to impede the ingress of termites into the building. We've got also got uh, continuous metal barriers and there's quite a few of those, uh, but the two main ones that are out there at the moment are termite type, which is mainly in Queensland, and Alterm which is here in New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and several other places as well. Like termi mesh, it generally goes around the perimeter of the building. Uh, it's called pinned and glued in so they can't move around the place and the data on it states that even the, if the building moves around a little or settles, uh, it won't damage or uh, ruin the integrity of the barrier. Graded stone barriers are mainly granite guard, although there are some others out there researching at the moment uh, with a view to maybe bringing up uh, a new version of a graded stone barrier. Um, like many of these things, once the patents begin to run out of date, people are trying to pounce on them to see if they can come up with something similar. But what's happening with granite guard, as we'll see in a little while, granite guard basically is a stone, and all the stones collected together at a certain grade will not allow the termites ingress through it. So they're too big to move out of the way and they're too small for them to crawl through. 
That stone goes into all the cavities uh, around penetrations. Uh, in some rare cases, it can be completely under the whole slab. Uh, also, that's fairly new are sealants. Uh, there's several different types on the market. Sometimes they'll use them in um, uh, expansion joints. Sometimes they'll use them where one set of concrete will abut the other. In rare cases, they'll they'll have it where they'll use it where maybe a concrete slab will abut piers and foundation walls or something like that. But these sealants are. I've uh, got the data to say or to prove, usually by the CSIRO, that when used in the correct manner, they will also uh, protect the building and impede the ingress into the building. Uh, cordon I put down there, cordon is actually a different type of system really. It's, uh, it's actually two layers of plastic, like your uh, plastic membrane that goes underneath a concrete slab. It's like that. In fact, there is a black section of it but it's also orange, so it's one line of orange uh, plastic, one black plastic, and in between them is a matrix impregnated with a pesticide known as deltamethrin. Uh, that's a synthetic pyrethroid, and it's been known to last for a long period of time. So, um, and also, um, if termites do try and burrow through it, they don't get very far. That's cordon, and that's quite a, a well-known product these days, and it's out there regularly. And of course, Home Guard, which is a fairly new kid on the block, Home Guard is um, is basically uh, a plasticized pesticide, if you like. It's uh, it's in rolls. You roll it out, and again, it goes around piers, foundation walls, or it can go under slabs. It can uh, go around penetrations. It can do all of those things, uh, and it's classified as a more well. It's it's more of a chemical barrier, but it is definitely a barrier that we're going to encounter when we're out there. Missing off the bottom of that are reticulation systems. What's going on there is that there's piping in the ground that goes around the perimeter of the building and uh, along these uh, pipe lengths there's either holes which allow the pesticide to be dispersed along the perimeter of the building or it'll have a thing called an emitter or emitters which is basically a, a jazzed up word for a, a hole but it's, um, it's got like a little uh, oval metal shape in there which allows the pesticide to disperse more evenly in the area that it's being emitted. Products like TermGuard, Altus, the Camilleri system are all forms and types of the reticulation systems. They're also characterised by having to have um, uh, charge points around the outside of the building which I'll show you later and in those charge points uh, they come along once every so often, depending upon the product and depending upon the warranty of the product and how long the pesticide lasts. They'll come along afterwards and they'll charge the system up and that can be done on a regular basis for the, uh, for the life of, or for however long the homeowner lives there. Not necessarily the life of the building, but however long the homeowner lives there, or the next homeowner, or the next homeowner really. So it's an ongoing thing. Please. To start off with here, yeah, we've just put the Termimesh system up there. In the case of Termimesh, You've got, um, often the termi mesh itself is brought up and it's, it's pinned and termi parged up on top of the slab. From there it goes to the two brick step down and it will go on top of the first course of bricks. Termi parge um, is a patented product used by termi mesh. It's basically uh, sand, cement and PVA, etc. So it forms like a slurry and then they just paint it all over it and make sure it stays put. And then once that's done, they'll lay the first course of bricks up on top of the termi mesh. And uh, in the first lot of specs that were approved by the CSIRO with termi mesh, um, it was agreed that the termi mesh itself would be um, um, placed three mil proud of the mortar, so you could at least see where it was. But since then, it's all changed. Mostly now, your termi mesh won't be seen, if if at all. And if it's if it's there, it's it's going to be about a half inch or so inside the mortar where you can't see it. The idea, of course, is that the termites get into the cavity. They'll come up into the cavity, and to get into the building, they've got to come up around the termite mesh, through the mortar, back around into the cavity again, and then into any timbers that they can find from that point forward. So it is quite difficult for them. The trouble with termite mesh, obviously, is that it doesn't necessarily fit in with the building game very well. Bricklayers don't like it. They tend to cut their hands on it, and the odd bricklayer put his trowel through it. 
So while it is a very good product, if it's installed properly, there is some building, um, just standard building problems with it. Not just on perimeters, but around penetration points. Uh, the termesh themselves, uh, they make a collar, and it's basically like a metal collar with a piece of termesh attached to it. That collar goes over the penetration point, and, um, and then it's, uh, the slab's poured afterwards, and then, of course, it's checked into the slab. Um, in the case of an infill slab, where you've got an inner leaf wall and an outer leaf wall, uh, they'll actually run the termi mesh uh, once the two levels get to a certain height, depending upon the building structure and uh, depending upon the plan, then they'll run termi mesh straight across the two courses of, of bricks, uh, covering the cavity, so the termites can't get up very far, and that's how it goes. Uh, I'm not sure if Alan mentioned, but uh, it's, it's quite a strange talking to uh, a silent crowd, mostly because of the way the technology is working, but there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions, and I'll answer as many questions as you like then. Until then, we're a silent crowd, apparently. Okay, away we go. There's various grades of metal barriers. I've just put a few metal barriers together here now, so you get some understanding of what the metal barriers are, how they look, and what they're for. Uh, over on the top right there, that's the... Um, they're the L-term uh, collars. Basically, they go over the penetrations. They slip over. Sometimes, depending upon the, uh, the specs on these things, sometimes they're glued on, sometimes they're not. Um, and depending upon the, um, the specs on them, sometimes they're actually put on um, and gone to the base and sitting up on top of the membrane so that they sit actually under the slab by the time the concrete slab's poured. Pr other products like Termimesh, for instance, uh, are actually in the middle of the slab after the slab's poured. So it just depends on the specs. There's also plastic collars, which I'll show you somewhere down the track. Um, some people only use collars. Uh, there's one particular brand. It started out, had a bit of a generic name called Brooks Shields because it was made by Brooks Pest Control. And, uh, but it basically it was a plastic sleeve, just like these metal ones that goes over the penetration points. Um, Metal barriers are pretty much installed very similarly to termi mesh, only that instead of coming up and coming up on top of the slab and sitting underneath the bottom wall plate, a lot of them are actually just pinned and glued to the side of the slab, and then they come around and usually up on top of the first course of bricks after that. Same idea, same principle. Many of my hours have been spent working out how termites can get into buildings around these slabs because I used to, when I used to work for the insurance company we were constantly working out whether the product was going to work or fail or whether we could apply warranty to it all those things and um, um, but you know in all fairness t both Termimesh and our term have got a good track record despite some of the building problems associated with them. Different again are these graded stone barriers may, mainly granite guard the main, uh, some of the main problems with granite guard is that some of the al allowable cavities for granite guard, where the, gra where the graded stone goes into, can be 40 mil. Well, if it's inside a cavity where there's been brick laying, and the uh, bricklayer or the person who was meant to be cleaning the bricks didn't clean the inside of the cavity, and there's still, you know, some overhang of mortar in there, you know, that's only got to be 10 mil either side, and then now you've got a 20 mil cavity. And that's been a problem. Termites have actually got in that way. So the building problems associated with granite guard are that, that those cavities need to be cleaned out properly before the granite guard goes in. And many people forget to do that. We've had cases where the termites have got into the building in a separate location and somebody's come along and put more granite, in, granite guard in to try and um, alleviate the problem. And having done that, the termites have tried to get back down where they were coming from and we had some trying to come up and some trying to go down. And they could, I'm sure they could smell each other. And they were trying to get through the granite guard. They couldn't get through it. But the main problem to start off with was because the cavities weren't cleaned out properly. Where the cavities are being cleaned out properly, where the correct amount of granite guard has been placed in the cavity, and where they've used a thing called strip shielding, which is that white one, not very clear, I'm sorry, on the right-hand picture there. Um, it's a plastic shielding that goes over the top. That is pretty much classified by most insurers to be a good barrier, as, long as, as I say, as long as it's been installed properly. Your evidence on site, mainly for granite guard, won't be very visible. Your evidence is going to be a sticker in the meter box. Because basically, unless you've got a, a
boroscope, and I know a lot of people have got those these days, you won't be able to see inside the cavity, so therefore you won't know that the granite guard's there. But it is there as long as the stick is in the meter box. Around penetrations, what they do, they come along with polystyrene foam collars first, and they put that around the actual penetration. Along comes the slab, it gets poured, leaving the polystyrene foam there. Then they come along with a bit of petrol, pour it over the polystyrene foam, which melts it. Then they put the, um, the granite guard in where the, the polystyrene foam was. Uh, like a lot of these products, like Alterm and uh, Termimesh, not necessarily Alterm, but certainly Termimesh and Granite Guard, in the earlier stages, um, before the concrete slab became a physical barrier in its own right, uh, it was only, I think it was about 1995, I think it was, 1995, all of a sudden concrete slabs became a physical barrier. Before that, they, they weren't a physical barrier. Um, or they weren't deemed to be a, a physical barrier against termites. Uh, but after 1995, they deemed that if a concrete slab was poured to either 2057 standard or, or uh, uh, 3660 standard, as long as they were poured to those two standards, which involved a lot of vibration and all those sorts of things, that it became a concrete. It became a physical barrier in its own right. Most of the slabs that I witnessed after that, despite the fact that the builders decided to use the concrete slab as a physical barrier, were never vibrated properly to the standard or anything else. But, I'm, but you know, so we've got the same kind of slab as we've always always had, really. Um, only the standard says that, that it now works. Uh, as a direct result of that, we've had some problems where, where slabs have cracked. Uh, termites only require 1.2 millimeter, 1.2 millimeters to get through, and they've done that. Not that much to be honest you know probably only about 0.05 percent of buildings that have been attacked by termites have had the termites coming through a 1.2 millimeter crack in the concrete but it is there you know um, the, pe the pest controllers themselves can get a negative opinion about that because a lot of the jobs that they get called out to are places where the concrete slab has cracked but if you measure it per capita there's not that many So yeah, you're basically looking for a sticker in the meter box for granite guard, and you're hoping that the, um, the termites haven't got through. If you've got a case then when you're doing your building inspections and you encounter um, damaged timbers in a relatively new house and the house has, been, um, ha has had granite guard installed, then uh, obviously you've got some sort of a problem on your hands where granite guard hasn't worked. And I bet you boots it's because the mortar left in the cavity was still there. Thanks. Basically your sealants come in uh, two different forms. One obviously out of a corking gun, so you can fill up little cracks and those sorts of things with it. But secondly it comes in like a paintable uh, form where you can just get your cans and brushes and things and paint it all on. Um, term is seal, or term seal I should say. Um, they're quite a large industry player now. They've got quite a bit of their product out there. And what they do, they actually um, they put a geotextile matrix in the middle of it as well, just to kind of make sure. So they put their first coat down, say, then they'll put their geotextile matrix over that, then they'll paint over that, then they might even put a second matrix over. It's like a, when I say a matrix, it's more like a, like a thin sheet, yeah? Like a thin sheet. Then they'll paint over that, and then, so it's quite thick. By the time it's finished, it's quite thick. Um, and uh, there's quite a lot of it out there now, so I assume that they, they got through the CSIRO okay and uh, all is working fine. Uh, where Term Seal and products like it have one in the industry or one out there in the field, it's, it's where it's very difficult to work out what other type of termite barrier you could use in the area. Where you've got like a high retaining wall or something or a high retaining wall that's attached to the house or something like that, these products worked very, very well because you can just come along, paint the product on, and you haven't got to worry about putting in, say, a reticulation system or working out how much termimesh you can get all over it and those sorts of things. But um, So that's the advantage of sealants. The disadvantage of sealants, obviously, is that like after you've uh, put... If the house is going to be used as a retaining wall in any way, shape or form, once you backfill, if there's any rock or rubble in that backfill, it can damage the sealant and then you're leaving a place that's open for termites. The two pictures that you can see there are actually charge points or filler points where the, uh, where, the re where the reticulation systems are. So they just pull those caps off and inside there there's like a ball cock sort of a setup where they come along and they just grab the hose off the back of the vehicle, 
attach it on and they'll pump so many litres into the reticulation system once every so often and that then reforms the barrier around the perimeter of the building. In the case of say um, an infill slab, they'll put an external ring line on and also an internal ring line on so to make sure that they're protecting both sides of the perimeter. More than that, they'll also run boxes or you know longer lengths around the penetrations, electrical conduits, that sort of stuff, and they'll make sure they protect everything. Anywhere the termites can get in. This diagram shows just that. It shows the uh, internal ring line and the external ring line. It shows where they go. Um, sometimes on building sites you'll see, for instance in the case of uh, term guard, you'll see uh, they'll have two different colour pipe. They'll have a green pipe and they'll have a pink pipe. What that's about is that the green pipe actually carries the pesticide to the pink pipe. The pink pipe is actually the emitting pipe or the dispersing pipe. So the green pipe is only there for carrying. One of the worst termite problems that I've seen uh, in the last 22 years that I've been in the industry is, has been associated with the, with the overall problem of, of infill slab. Infill slabs are possibly the worst things invented when it comes down to termite entry because there's just so many little places where the termites can get through. The, termite, the, the concrete's only got to be uh, a little bit irregular, uh, only needs a couple of mil and the termites can find their way through. Um, the worst cases have been where there's been no inner leaf wall but the concrete slab on the inside has been laid directly up on top of the foundation. There's been more cases where termites have entered buildings through the interior that way than any other in terms of infill slab. So we want to now be able to identify the various slab designs, the various construction joints, they're obviously very important, and understand the critical areas of slab construction and their design and, and how they're being protected by termite management systems. Here's your typical monolithic slab. The blue sections there are pretty much the, like your ground level, if you like. Um, on some of the diagrams coming up, you'll actually see a GL. That stands for ground level. It gives you some idea. And the red lines are showing the possible termite entry points. As you can see um, in this brick, this brick veneer, there's actually a termite barrier coming down off that wall there coming down and it's coming, or it could be the flashing I guess, but it's coming down and it's sitting up on top of the first uh, course of bricks. The circled area there with the penetration point is obviously an area that also requires some form of termite barrier. Now Z-bar construction is not something that we encountered that much, but this will also help us with, with infill slabs where the internal slab is sitting directly up on top of the footing. In that case, as I say, if that Z bar is missing, although even with Z bars, they're not actually continuous. They're only there just to tie the two slabs together or the two lots of concrete together. So they don't actually work as a termite barrier. There's all gaps along the way. They're just like ties of, you know, so yay long. Um, the problem with that, obviously, is that if they do actually get up in between those two areas, they can get in between the Z bar and get into the cavity and away they go. If you remove the Z-bar for a second and just look at it as a, as a concrete slab up on top of a footing, as I said to you before, my last comments, anything irregular only has to be 1.2 millimetres and the termites can get through. So here we have the case where you've got strip footings, inner leaf wall, outer leaf wall, and you've got the, uh, the red lines there noting the possible places where termites can gain entry or gain access. In the old days when we used to use the organochlorines, there were so many cases where uh, the job wasn't done properly, but the, in its favour the, the organochlorines were so forgiving, they were able to sort of take care of things much better than the products that we now use on new buildings. Uh, the problem was that blue section in front, inside the interleaf wall there should have been dug right down to the footing and treat it all the way back up to the top in many, in many cases that wasn't done in the old days. Um, these days with reticulation and physical barriers and things like that we've actually um, counteracted that problem 
and the incidence of termite attack in new buildings because of that has reduced considerably. I'm just showing these. Obviously, you know, you guys are builders. I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you're going to get places in in concrete subs that are not just thickened. They're going to they're going to have joins. I'll go to joins in a second, and. Um, while those areas there are thickened, uh, it's mainly just to, to, to bring you on to the next conversation really about moving away from thickened areas and into joined areas. Uh, mostly we still only re really require, in the case of say an infill slab, uh, in the case of uh, say a reticulation system, we really only need the inner ring in these, in these cases. Where there's a join though, we need something completely different, which we'll move on to. Obviously sometimes you're going to get a bit of a mix and a match. Um, one section joins to the other. However, it depends on what's in the middle there. It depends on what it's joining to. Um, I'm thinking more of a garage here, in the that's sort of a uh, single brick wall. If it's a single brick wall and there's not enough protection underneath where the strip footings have been, then again, you're looking at another area where termites can gain entry or und undetected entry. And some will say, but you hang on, it's a garage, it's got a single brick wall. If they come up around that slab and into the garage, you're going to be able to see them. The first thing people do when they move into a garage, they'll move, their, move into the home, is to start putting up fixtures in the garage. They put up timber shelving, all sorts of things, and that's what the termites eat. Again, we've seen these before. They're just sort of standard um, concrete slabs. This one's got thickened beams or piers. I guess they're probably moving to a maybe two-storey split-level place or something like that just to um, take care of that problem. The next lot are going to be some joints. Uh, this is a key joint. Now, I know some of these are fairly common to you. Some of them are not so common. It'll depend on uh, what type of building construction you're used to, where you've lived before. Uh, remember, this course is, or the first one that I wrote, was money for the whole country. So some states have got this particular joint, some have got that, that sort of joint, and so the joints vary from state to state. I just hope along the way we pick up the ones that you see regularly. So in the case of a key joint, now in that particular case, um, there's not too many things that you can use really to counteract a problem where you're adding a, a, a key joint uh, maybe um, after the main construction's already built. So in that case, where we're dealing with both new buildings and existing buildings with additions, we're looking for products that can service us in such a way that we can take care of that joint. Yes, you could probably use a chemical barrier under it, but it's a bit, you know, it's a bit hard to do that because if you don't treat the entire area and only a portion of the area is treated, who knows what can happen and, you know, what you, while we can't continually see under a slab, we just don't know what's going on under there. Probably in these particular cases, you're better off with a, some sort of physical barrier. Uh, I've seen termi mesh used quite well in this particular case. What they do, they lay the termi mesh over the top of the, the joint, then they parge it to the top of the slab, and it sits quite flat and level. And after they've done that, then um, obviously whatever flooring goes on after that. Metal barriers have been used, but not necessarily on top. They've been used under, underneath the actual uh, joint. Um, but then by doing that, you can't monitor how well the, um, the metal barrier has been attached to the, to the base. Sealants have also been used in this cases, in this case, all these cases. Uh, having said that though, you know, um, I personally wouldn't go for a sealant in a case like that. Not, uh, not that I'm putting sealants down, not that I'm putting the CSIRO down, only because uh, I've had a lot of experience in these things. I would prefer to go to, for something like termi mesh or one of those metal barriers. Um, the other thing that can be used, obviously, is home guard and reticulation systems. Home guard is laid, laid all the way underneath the, um, the, the joint. And um, with uh, term guard, they, they'll either put one line of pipe directly along the joint or they'll put one either side of the joint, depending upon the, the style and, the, and the, um, the size of the actual joint. Here we have a dowel joint. It pretty much... All the comments that I've just made previously would probably work out to be here as well. Um, in these cases, um, they would actually put turbo mesh on top or they'll put maybe term guard underneath. Um, as, as long as it's been parged properly, it will work quite well. Some people worry about saw joints, some don't. Um, I don't know about you, but the amount of saw joints that I've seen crack has been phenomenal. 
So we believe that um, some form of protection should be going underneath that saw joint just in case that does happen. And again, it can be either um, you know a line of term guard or maybe um, maybe maybe even a sealant on the top, uh, or even one of those metal barriers that fits under underneath. Home guard could also go under there. Um, any of those products would work. Same with a form groove joint. Same again. Same products. Again, you know, sometimes we have to look at these products, or look at these joints. I should say, we've got to decide where the joint's running to, where it's coming from whether it affects the perimeter of the building, whether that joint is running to an area where termites may be able to gain undetected entry. And if it's any of those things, we've got to look at what kind of barrier we can put in place. So many times I've gone out after a builder, and especially after additions, and they've used exactly what was on the specifications to put into the building, but unfortunately it hasn't actually being placed in a way that it's going to restrict the termites from getting into the building. It still leaves gaps and holes where the termites can gain that entry. Expansion joint, same products. Used the same way. Dep again, if it's only, a, uh, say, a joint on a concrete driveway leading up to a house, then it doesn't so matter so much. It depends where the expansion joint's going and whether it abuts a another part of the house and whether it leaves a gap where termites can gain undetected entry. All joints must be protected if it's within the perimeter of the structure and or abutting the structure. That's the, the, key, the key thing to know about all these barriers. I want to just show you now a few areas where termites have gained entry to buildings and perhaps you'll be able to see some of the reasons why. Where you've got timber in direct contact with the soil, what happens is that the termites may not attack the timber straight off the bat. But as the timber gains a certain moisture content, and as, it, um, as the moisture content dilapidates the timber in a certain way, it reaches a critical point where termites absolutely love it. And where you've got timber like that uses maybe on a veranda or a lean-to, pergola, any of those things, the termites can get into the building, up those posts, along the rafters, through the fascia, and into the roof. Simple things. Mightn't look like very much. That's maybe less than maybe half a metre, that thing. But you know, it's, it's hiding an area. It's, a, it's hiding an area where termites can get in. One of the jobs I did years ago was a guy um, who used to work for me, and he said, can you come out and inspect my property because I've got termites. And when I got there, he had a very thick slab. He probably had about 150 mil exposed all the way around the house, all the way around, except for a one by one metre concrete slab which was at his front door. And guess where the termites got in? In that one little spot right there and they made it all the way to the roof and he had a split level two storey house. So while we might minimise something as small as that, if termites are going to go in, if, if there's no other place for the termites to get in, that's the place that they'll look for to get in. Okay. Um, in the Australian Standard 3.60.1, it talks about the edge of the concrete slab being smooth, off the form, <laughs> continuous. Uh, this represents none of those things. And obviously this is where uh, termites can gain undetected entry because of all the irregularities in the concrete. Concrete slabs covering weep holes, number one spot for termites. The amount of times we've, we've had to go out after a problem like that and try and solve it. In some cases we've actually cut the concrete away up to 300 millimetres just so we can either install some extra barrier or, or at least create a buffer zone so we can inspect the area before the termites gain entry again. That's pipe going straight through the edge of the concrete slab into the building, an afterthought. Holes in the side of the building for no apparent reason. Electrical conduits going into a building as an afterthought. Extra walls being put into a building as an afterthought. <laughs> Something's gone wrong here. So, something in the, in the length of the concrete slab 
or the overall length of the wall has been a mismatch. The bottom wall plate is out hanging over the edge of the slab. Obviously come out as a truss and it's just been split there and uh, now you've got a piece of timber holding up the edge of it which is in direct contact with the soil and the house isn't even finished yet. Over in Perth they've got this wonderful way of, um, of pouring concrete slabs in one go but in, if, if it's going to have a sunken bath they'll leave a hole where the bath's going to go. <laughs> so the, this isn't one of those cases but I'm coming back to this in a second. So then they'll lay the bath into the hole and they won't put any kind of termite sealant around the bath. And we've had quite a few cases now where the termites have come up around the bath and got into the house that way. This is a case where um, during renovations they open up this area and there's the concrete there and you can see that the, um, this obviously wasn't sealed correctly at the start or wasn't poured in one form and now you've got termite, this is termite mud here coming up and getting into the building. Formwork being left in causes this problem. Now while that was stopped before it got too far and they only ate the formwork, I don't know, I'd be a bit worried. <laughs> There's a series of abutments there and joins which are very difficult to protect and it doesn't make it any easier when the edges of the concrete slab is not smooth enough the form, it's all irregular. So they're just things to watch out for. Things like that are very hard to protect. If, if you find a building, like for instance this top right corner here, you've got concrete block abutting brick. And if there's nothing protecting the base down there properly, the termites have a field day getting to that building, they find all sorts of ways in. That was a finished building, you've got pieces of of, um, I think that's termi mesh. I think there's pieces of termi mesh hanging out, uh, and if that's the case, it's not protecting the um, conduits and things like that. Again, it's irregular, so it's easier for the termites to hide their way around those places. Yeah. I mentioned previously now, just, I just wanted to run through a few of the ways that, um, that uh, barriers are placed in buildings. This is a standard way that they put down um, collars. Uh, these are mainly the term guard collars and they've got two, two ridges on them so that it makes it more difficult for the termites to get around. They sit on the, uh, on the base of the, of the slab, on, up on top of the plastic membrane. So yeah, they've got to trim a bit of Rio out before they put it in and they use a, a certain glue put together by, um, by the term guard company that's been approved by ABSAC and the CSIRO. They put it on, they do a bit of a turn, they get it nice and flat there and it, that's how it sits pretty much and the concrete slab sits on top of it, but the, um, the ridges on the bottom are checked into the slab underneath. In the case of a waffle pod, or a waffle box, whatever you want to call it, you've got to break some of the waffle pod away if the penetrations are coming through the middle of it. And that's not always easy. I don't know if you've done very much waffle pod work, but you've got to walk on top of the waffle pods to get to it. And then you've got to kind of cut it away with a knife as best you can without breaking up too much of it. And then you put it down as best you can. The theory behind waffle pods, as you know, the, the waffle pod slab is supposed to be the strongest slab because of its design. Unfortunately, uh, while there's no scientific data on it, uh, polystyrene foam actually attracts termites. So basically what you've got in a house with a waffle pod is a great big termite bait box. Depending upon uh, where the penetration pipe is positioned, depending upon the, you know, the 90 degree angles or whatever, you may have to alter, or the, the person installing the, um, the cap may have to alter the way that they put down. In the case of the, the pipe on the right, um, there was a bit of a bend there. Sometimes that it may have to be that the collar is checked into, the, the whole collar is checked into the slab, not just the base of it. Just want to run through a few retaining walls now and work out some of the methods that people are using to protect or pr protect those walls that are going to be exposed to termites once the soil has been backfilled to the area. TermGuard have got a way that they, they put their piping down in layers. So it actually goes up the profile of the wall and uh, they've worked it out that way. Only, but they've also worked out the science on, on, um, 
on how to actually disperse the liquid within the piping as well because if you because it because it's like gravity they what was happening when they first trialed it was that the pesticide was hitting the bottom and then all the pesticide was flying out of the bottom pipe and not, not too much was coming up the profile of the wall so they had to alter the science and change the pipe structure and the uh, the piping formation to assist the pesticide to go all the way down the other way to that's one way the other way of course is to use the sealants paint the sealant on was the other uh, and the other way is to I mean if you if the client's got the means to fill the whole cavity up with granite guard that's a that's a big way of doing it depending on how big it is but as you know a lot of the new units and flats and things that we've got these days the stairwell box or the you know the, the brick and concrete stairwell box isn't that very big inside sometimes it's filled sometimes it's not so where it's not filled they'll they'll put some sort of a barrier on the on the soil inside the the uh, the box if it is going to be filled, they'll run a profile of term guard or a sealant up that wall to counteract that problem. On some house perimeters, you'll see there'll be a, a wall plate which will denote which barrier has been installed into the building. If they actually do that, well then that really helps you because <laughs> you actually read it. Um, the two that are usually doing that one is granite guard and term guard and these are the two types of plates that you'll see. And that pretty much concludes the, at least the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and as Alan will, will open now the floor for question time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Matthew. Um, just a couple of questions, if I might, firstly. Sealants, are they approved by the BCA? Um, you have to check that one. They've, mostly the things that are, that are out there now have been approved uh, using Australian Standard 3660.3. Um, they usually don't get a jumper until they've been through the CSIRO and, or, and, and one or two others, like ABSAC or somebody else. So usually if they've gone through those hurdles, usually that's, that's enough for them allowed to be able to be used out there. Okay. Right. Uh, that's the best answer right. I've got for that one. No, thanks, Matthew. And the other thing is, um, what I see a lot of is the impregnated uh, orange uh, barrier. Yep. Lapped and so, sort of partially taped, but right. the tape's usually coming off and it's flapping and w what's the correct method of, of joining, of lapping it? Uh, okay, um, there is an actual, you're talking about the, the lengths? Yes. Yeah, the, it's got to be folded a certain way yep. and then it's got to be, they, they use a thing called ducting tape which you can go and buy by the way, but apparently according to the CSIRO the ducting tape has got data now and it's, it's proven to, in, in the way that it's being used, to, um, in conjunction with the barrier, to hold the barrier together long enough uh, for after the concrete slab goes down to keep it there and it will work. Um, the trouble is, not so much when the long um, lines are joined, it's where, the, where it goes over a penetration point, because yep. they actually cut a star in it and run it over, then they run ducting tape all the way up the penetration pipe. And, uh, I've always been concerned about that, but apparently I'm not allowed to say that, am I? Uh, it's been working fine so far. You know, very little uh, backlash on it, so I assume that it's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, gentlemen, I'll, I'll come round now for any questions. We're using uh, cordon um, in, in the in a retaining wall. That's a double retaining wall with a cavity uh, in between, and um, the guy put the cordon vertical put it on vertically with duct tape and it fell off five minutes later before he got in his car, you know. Right. Um, now you're saying that it's okay just uh, while it was getting held in place and I think it did sort of fall back together when we poured the cavity with concrete. But if I poured the cavity with concrete, concrete did, but did I really need the cord on? And also just quickly the now they've taken the arsenic out of treated pine, is that okay now or has it got a lifespan or do you know about that? <laughs> All Thanks. right, well I'll answer the first question. The first question, obviously if it's in the specs to have cordon put in there then, I mean, whichever termite barrier, when the builder obviously and the architect makes a choice on all these building products, they make a choice on what grade they're all going to be. So even though something might appear to be a, a termite barrier, it may not be the right grade. 
So they, they would then put a termite barrier in there to alleviate that particular problem. That's the only way. Without looking at a complete drawing and, and looking at what was going on, that's the only answer I've got for you. The other, the second part of the, uh, the question, no, it shouldn't fall down. And I think maybe if that guy should have been rung up and say, mate, your barrier just fell down, maybe we should come back and fix it back up again. Separate at the seam, said it. Yeah, well, see, that shouldn't happen either. It should be in their place, ready for whatever concrete to come in and cover it up. Uh, yeah, well, copper chromium arsenic. Well, <clears throat> the data is saying, do you know how, how copper chromium arsenic salts work? Basically, they put the timber under a vacuum and uh, then they uh, extract the moisture and under vacuum then they replace the moisture with uh, copper chromium and arsenic salts. Yes, the arsenic is being deleted now, but they're still finding with tests that the, that, the, that the copper salts and the chromium salts are still holding together very well and, and keeping borers and termites at bay. But just be mindful, don't cut the end and put it in the ground. <laughs> when I was at TAFE years ago, the termites went straight through the centre of the timber because it didn't, go, didn't penetrate right to the core. Yeah, yeah. I have a question, Jenna. I've got no question, but just add something to 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 your talking about the, um, you said you just come and look, the sticker is there in a meter box and that should be enough. But Australian standard 36,000.1 is say that also, I'm not sure if a lot of people here knows, that on the end of the day, the installer has to give you the certificate of compliance not just m many of them installers just say I installed 15 meters of cordon or, or any any system, and that's about that. He's covered himself. Yeah, I but was that, having. But I the was building that would doesn't. Come up during question time. Sorry. I was hoping that would come up during question time. Yeah, but yeah. it doesn't. Because it do, that doesn't mean that, when I teach doesn't mean subject, the building it's it's uh, covered. With comes the, yeah. Up. So I'd, I'm just encouraging these people make sure the installer when he comes, he say first question is. Can you protect the, you know, this building or this structure, and gives me say, under the slab, which is a uh, penetration, physical barrier, uh, barrier around the building, and also compliance certificate to say that the, this system will, will uh, in accordance with the, the whole thing, with the uh, thirty-six thousand point one part one. So that's really well said. I might add a bit more to that if you don't mind. I'll say this, that, yeah, in every building, you're going to get a mixture of termite barriers. That's right. You're going to get the builder who, who will use the concrete slab as a barrier. So the, the, the concreter is supposed to certify that slab as being poured to a certain standard. Okay. That's number one. You might get a bit of termite mesh, a bit of granite guard, a bit of reticulation, everything in one building. I've had that happen. Yeah, and it's up to every individual installer to provide a certificate of compliance, as you put it, for the part that they did, for the section that they did then at the end of the day, the builder collates them all together, they've got them all together, and then they're submitted to the various bodies. Okay. All right? Because we're talking about new buildings. If it's, a, if it's an existing building, and you're adding an addition, again, the person who actually installed the barrier needs to provide a certificate of compliance for the area that he's done and he would also have a sticker in the meter box to show the area treated. But also, I would also say that before that installer puts, or at least the company who did the installation, puts that barrier down, they should also do a full inspection of the entire house before they start, because there's been people who, who have brought themselves undone because of that. There was already active termites in the house, and they put the ad addition on afterwards, and then the, the termites somehow bypass the new barrier that's gone down, and they've gone through the roof into the new section. Yeah. Um, one of the issues we're having is that you can uh, get advice from all the different manufacturers of termite protection and they've all got their own opinion. Um, we've got probably 10 jobs on at the moment with 10 jobs of different opinions from different providers in regards to termite protection. Um, where, where do we stand when we've got a termite, well, look, put it this way, if we're on a job where we've had a termite guy, we've engaged to do termite protection as a cordon system. Cordon, right, yep. yeah. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, considering some of the other jobs we've done called on, I think this guy's been over the top. Now, he won't give us a certificate if I start telling him, well, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, although you're questioning what he's doing. 
the problem I have is I don't think he's experienced enough in understanding what he should and should, shouldn't be protecting. Where do we stand as builders in that instance where if I say to this guy, look, I don't, I'm not happy with you, see you later, I'm going to get someone else to do the job. Because the issue I have, I've got that, that's one job. I've got another job where I've had two termite guys Tricky. T on the site yep. um, who are giving us two, two opinions on, on a, an existing building uh, and they're miles apart. You're going to get that. Yeah, I, I, that's but I reckon everyone's yeah, got it. I'm yeah, just, what yeah. do we do? I guess, I mean, what my mind starts to go, as soon as you ask a question, like my mind starts to go on, on what could have happened previously. See, if you've had one guy in there already and he's already partially yeah. installed some of the barrier, yeah. Yeah. we don't know. And it's, it's a hard question to, to answer because I'm not sure how much barrier is already down there. Well, it's not when so much the barrier. you sort of sack him and bring the next guy well, in. It's not that. It's just at the end of the day, this guy to me is on square meters, right? And that's all I seem to be, that's the way I feel with him. But the, the example I was going to give you on one job, we, we've got a cordon guy doing the, the new addition, and what we did is the existing part of the building, we doing some renovation work, found out it's got termites. We had the cordon guy come out, our guy came out and gave us a, a recommendation what to do to the existing building. The client's termite guy that's been doing their termite protection, it's in a school, but been doing the termite protection for the last five years, said, no, 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 this is what you've got to do, blah, 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 until I said to him, well, five years ago, that you've, you've had termites all through the front of this building, and he didn't know what to say, and that happened today. Right? So, yeah, well, I, and, and I don't know what to do, because the client's well, look, going, what do you do? Put it, put it this way. Say, for instance, I'll, I'll use termites just for yeah. fun, all right? There is um, allowance to be able to place termimesh under the entire slab, yeah? yeah? The entire building. And all around the perimeter, everywhere. And even, even I mean, and then if you're adding more onto it later on, if they're doing, um, uh, say, an infill, and you've got inner leaf wall and outer leaf wall, they could not only have it underneath the slab, but also along the perimeter as well. Oh, but you, can, you, can, you can go overboard as much as you like. I mean, but if somebody is it, said to you, what's it, but, but is it overboard? For example, we're using termimesh on a job where it's actually under the back of the wall, up right up behind the retainer wall. And we use Timmy Mesh on that job because a lot of the stuff's rendered, so you can render over it as render a semi yeah. uh, sort of product. Yep. Um, and I've got another job in uh, Longerville where the guys put um, the cord on over like a complete wall between an existing retainer wall and the garage. Right. And it must be like 50 square metres of the stuff. Right. Um, I just question that why, why it's required on sort of one building, not the other building. But like you said, yeah, one would ask the same question. Yeah, and the thing yeah, is, the if, you've got, if you've got a retaining wall, you've got to protect it somehow, especially yeah. if it's going to have soil backed up against it afterwards. Yeah, well, some of the stuff's existing, but it's, to me, it's more the issue of where do we stand when we got to, we're questioning what these guys are doing? Because to me, the, you know, they're supposed to be the approved installers and applicators, or call them whatever you want. But the, to me, a lot of these guys aren't experienced enough. Yeah. To, it's like waterproofing; it's no different. So they've yeah. all got an opinion on what's, right. what's right and what's not. All right, the answer. The answer is, well, the first thing, consult, go back to the, the owner of the company, you know. For instance, one of the guys that I deal with in terms of, she's quite good. He's, yeah. he's, he's a plan man. He's always watching plans, checking the, things, the, checking specs. The, so, but then if, it doesn't, if that doesn't work, yeah. because you still believe that the guy who owns the, owns the company mm. doesn't know what he's doing, um, on the, um, you've got a document that you can use associated with the certificate of compliance where you can put down your reasons for deviation. And if there's a problem there associated with any of the barriers that you're putting down, and you're not happy that the barrier has been installed the way you believe it should have been, you can yeah. jot that so, down. So you think the so then you can at least, you, I mean, if it comes back back on you later on, yeah. at least you can say, well, hang on, yeah. I made a comment here, and I made this comment known that I believe this barrier yeah. wasn't put the, down. To properly. me, that's not an issue with with whether or not I get a certificate, because at the end of the day, most of the certifiers these days wouldn't even know what to ask for on a certificate. The issue I have is prevention is better than cure, right? Yeah. So the, the old the old go yeah. saying goes that. If the guy, if, the, if you sit there and only put half the stuff he puts in, in five years' time you get too much, the, the chance though you never find the bite. Yeah. Right. So you, you're stuck with the problem anyway. But it's to me that it's like I said, even with too much, because they work in different sectors, right? We we do jobs north and south. The guys that do south and too much are different company than the yeah. guys that do north. But so you're you don't the, deal with the you're same. the builder, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid the buck sort of stops with you. Oh, there's no if doubt you're, it does. If you're not happy, then you've got to tell a guy, now I don't believe that's been installed properly and I want it installed this way. And if they're not prepared to do that, you, yeah, you're quite right. Get another guy who'll do it the way you want it. There's this probably yeah. also the opportunity to go back to the supplier, like Termi Mesh themselves. Yeah. The technical advisors with them. It's the same course, as with yeah. waterproofing or any other product where you align somebody else's expertise. You've got to make a judgment as to whether you're satisfied Good with comment. what they're doing. Yeah. And if you're not, then you need to call in a consultant or go back to the supplier.
to their technician. Same as paint, I, any product. If you're, you're not happy with yeah. with that, ask for a technical opinion. And too, we should have technical management people too. there who will come along. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in the termi mesh, you mentioned um, they used to run the termi mesh past the outside brickwork, and now they've cut it back. On that continuous metal uh, treatment, in the diagram, I noticed that it protruded past the brickwork. Yeah, their their game is to, um, in their marketing and uh, what they're offering, is that with, say, Alterm, Alterm is a uh, marketed as a termite barrier, a damp-proof course, and flashing. So that's the reason why I've got all that up there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the short answer is probably no. Um, there's been uh, cases that we've had where there's been batches of termi mesh that um, they're supposed to be you know, graded stainless steel barriers. You know, they're supposed to be st uh, stainless steel mesh, but unfortunately there must have been some problem with the manufacturer, and uh, we've had cases where termi mesh is rusted out. Uh, we had cases in the early days where Alterm's bituminous coating came off and at the area that where it was glued and there was but they fixed all that sort of stuff in the early state in the teething area, you know, teething problems. Uh, but yes there was a there was a time there which is quite noted around the place where um, termi mesh uh, did did rust for a little while until they sorted that problem out. Final question. Sure. Uh, you made a comment earlier that uh, when the installer comes in that he should make an inspection of the rest of the building, but that sort of implies that that is sort of um, not really required or not compulsory. Does that sort of encourage, and then the compliance certificate only covers that aspect of work that they've done, does that sort of encourage us selling that product rather than creating a system which protects the building? Because if they, if it was... Sorry, I got, I got the first part of the question down, but you've, you've added something else to the second part. The inspection of the whole building yeah. and then... Because as builders, we're, we're, we're uh, sort of relying on advice from experts to right. put in a system. Yep. If, they, if that check was compulsory and then they come up with a, a system to implement, rather than just providing a compliance certificate to cover that aspect of work they've done, because that sort of encourages people just to sell yeah. their product, because it, it only protects what they've done rather than the whole building as such. That's right. I, I said that to you more as an, an advice, yep. because after having years of work in the insurance company, uh, one of the problems that we faced was where somebody was adding to a new build, an old building, mm. and, and only tr only fixing the little bit of only putting a little bit of a barrier down where the the new section of the building is being built, and uh, you know, but there is well number one there is provision in the Australian Standard three double six zero point one to check the area um, when the termite barriers are going down, old stumps, if there's areas on the site that have got active termites, you know those things need to be noted down, and they are reasons for deviation. On your, on your certificates need to be jotted down there. So we're just saying to everybody, why not do that? I mean, if, you, if you're going to be doing an inspection on the site, why not do an inspection on the building while you're there, the old building, before the new part gets added? Because um, we've had cases where the termites have been active in the old building and got into the new building around the, around the new barrier. Thank you, Matthew. Um, in, with that last um, discussion, uh, as a builder, it's in your interest where, when you're doing a, a rear extension to recommend to your client that they uh, have a pest inspection and provide recommendations on how the whole area should be treated. That way you're putting it back on them. Yeah. The pest consultant will come back with recommendations, with some options. You put them to the client. It's their choice then if they choose just to um, only protect the new part. Well, that's their decision. Um, Matthew, thanks very much. Very interesting. Oh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hope you enjoy that. <laughs> thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you, you very much, Matthew. Thank you, folks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, to finish off a few things before uh, Phil Sim addresses the meeting. Uh, our next meeting will be on the 12th of February 2008 uh, on alternative dispute resolution, uh, theory meets practice, which is by Robert Riddell, a partner at Gaddens Lawyers. Um, as a few of you are probably aware, there has been some changes to the CBD uh, and that will commence from the 1st of January. Uh, the learning category 1 will now be 1 point per hour and learning category 2 will be 2 points per hour. As I say, this starts the 1st of January. We're not certain of the details really as to what category um, will fall in. Hopefully it will be category 2, but uh, time will tell. 
but the, the basis is that we still we only need 12 points per year now, which will make things much easier. Um, when we finish up here, there'll be DVDs from the last meeting, which is estimating for builders at the back with a question sheet if you weren't able to come to the previous meeting. Um, if you could leave your, your, your attendees check sheet there as well, uh, Graham will give you a receipt. Uh, there's also a diary there for, for members only and you've got to show your ABS card to be able to receive one. If you didn't bring it with you, don't worry, we'll be posting one out to you. Um, that's it for me. Listen, thanks very much for this year for coming along to all the meetings. I hope they've been enjoyable. I'd personally like to um, wish you all Merry Christmas and, and your families. And I'll um, introduce Phil Sim, who I'm sure will like to talk to you about a similar vein. Thank you. I've come equipped, gentlemen and uh, ladies. Uh, basically, look, I won't hold you up. I'd just like to say thank you uh, very much uh, on behalf of ABS for belonging uh, to us. I'd like to think that our service uh, for this year and the last uh, couple of years have been uh, up to your expectations. Uh, it, it's another year coming up next year. Our membership from the builders is just growing and growing. We're uh, really concentrating now. We started off last uh, month of Victoria and we've held back from there over for various reasons to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing here in New South Wales. We have builders throughout all of Australia apart from the two states, Queensland and the Territory uh, NT, government run. Uh, they reckon that's the greatest way to go. Who knows? But it's not going to change. What we have is what we have here. I hope that it is of an assistance to you to get out there and build again. I hear nothing but compliments, but for God's sake, uh, my cards and all the uh, diaries, you've got direct contact to me. If there's something bad or it's upsetting you, please phone. It's all very well getting the nice things, um, but there's got to be some bad things, and I don't expect my staff to handle it all the time. But once again, thank you very much. We are giving out, as Alan said, a bottle of port. If you don't drink it, just leave it, that's fine. Um, again, we've got a diary, and for the members that have had the diary, uh, I think you'll find that it's uh, a worthwhile, it's not an El Cheapo, it's full of information. And now that we have uh, Dan uh, on board with AAI, he does miss the chance, so there's uh, a me uh, uh, details of all other insurances that you may need and do need. Uh, again, as a one-stop shop, uh, Dan's uh, managed to get himself into the diary. And we've also got a desk calendar, uh, again with AAI over it. It just seemed the way to go. It's going to more places uh, just for a change to help out then. So what with that, um, just thank you very much and have a Merry Christmas. And if anybody wants to come down and have a drink, uh, Dane, if you want a Coke downstairs, I'll buy you two Cokes or whatever. Uh, the drinks are on me uh, tonight. So thank you very much, guys.